I, this week I came across some advice to dads and it was called dad vice. <laughs> it said a dad is born nine months before a baby is born. The job starts when the pregnancy test displays a plus sign. <laughs> Take every blanket, pacifier, and formula packet that they give you at the hospital. You paid for it. <laughs> a diaper bag, by the way, is just a bag filled with diapers. You don't need to go buy one. If you own a backpack, you own a diaper bag. And cargo shorts are a diaper bag that you can wear. And speaking of diapers, how many dads remember this? Your baby's first poop <laughs> will resemble crude oil. <laughs> don't freak out. <laughs> I remember that like it was yesterday. What is this? I've never seen this. What do I do? And... I was tempted to freak out. Have your wife leave you a voicemail of the baby screaming. Save it. Play it for friends and coworkers when you're in need of a good excuse. <laughs> I like this one. A kid's childhood does not need to be luxurious perfection. Just aim for pleasurable survival. <laughs> when it comes to raising children, your grandparents' philosophical advice will be spot on. Their medical advice will be terrible. <laughs> Oh, my goodness. A zoo is a fun way to introduce kids to the concept of life without parole. I don't, I don't, I don't write these. I just, just sound it. You will be in charge of the plunger, so get used to it. And if you ask your child who broke the lamp and she answers you while dancing, she's telling the truth. <laughs> if they forget their lunch at home, don't pick up a happy meal and deliver it to them at school. They will start forgetting their lunch on a regular basis. <laughs> and I did not know this. Dark chocolate works as well as an over-the-counter cough suppressant. <laughs> and the last one, the problem with being a father is once you're really, really good at it, you're unemployed. <laughs> Actually, that's not really true, is it? But the role does change. And uh, so, dads, we honor you this morning, and we're thankful for you and thankful for the role as I was praying a moment ago, it, it's, I don't know if you're like me, but on Father's Day, it's a little bit of a mixed bag of emotions because while there are those successes and there are those proud moments where you look back and you say, you know, I'm doing okay. A lot of times there, there are also those days when you just feel like I'm not doing so okay. And, and you just, Father's Day, there, there's a little bit of a danger of focusing too much on us dads because on the one hand, we can get a little bit carried away in our pride or sometimes we can get just sort of whisked away uh, with thoughts of regret or, or sadness, you know. Uh, because uh, for all of us in one measure or another, life doesn't exactly work out the way we plan. Um, and as I am fond of saying, it's okay, really, because God isn't working out life according to your plan. He's working out life according to his plan. And the fact of the matter is, fatherhood, as the Bible presents it, is a high and holy calling, to be sure. In fact, it's impossible. We just can't do it. And he never intended us to do it in our own strength. He wants us to be looking at him. God is parenting us. And over the years, I'm learning to, to think of Father's Day in these terms because what it does is it, it's, it's, um, it truly makes it a celebration and, and it lifts the burden and I don't get stuck thinking too much about me. I get to celebrate my Father in heaven. Whether I had a good dad, a faithful dad, or not so much. Whether I have been a, a faithful dad in every way I'd hope or not so much. I can look at the Father in heaven, and I can see the one who's perfect and faithful and worthy of celebrating and, and worthy of knowing and loving. And, and it, it is this high and holy calling. It's also a precious gift. What a gift it is, this role of fatherhood. It, it's scary but wonderful at the same time. What an adventure. It's filled with potential and, and purpose. It's surprisingly simple and yet the most humbling thing you'll ever do. Very, very challenging. Sometimes it's hilarious. Other times it can be sad and heartbreaking. It is heart-revealing for sure and soul-forming. It's a faith-building exercise in us and in our kids, isn't it? 
It's filled with huge potential for positive world change and preparation for heaven. Another good thing to keep in mind. But most of all, to me, it's a picture of God. Just like marriage is a picture for us. I think fatherhood is a picture of God and his faithful love. And so I don't know what, what you tend to think of or how you feel about Father's Day. Sometimes I will have mothers just beg me, don't do a Mother's Day service. I don't like all the attention. And, so, and it's a sad day for some for many valid reasons. And it's just that way for dads. Sometimes dads say, well, what are you going to say to the dads? You know, I notice you're a lot nicer to the moms than the dads, Pastor, you know. And you sort of brace yourself. <laughs> you know, I, I will encourage you to be careful about how you hear the message this morning because you know what happens? I have found that sometimes dads go away feeling beat up and, 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 and I've learned over the years that, well, sometimes it can be maybe, you know, whoever's preaching the message isn't exactly sensitive or uh, whatever, but, but, you know, just remember this. It's a spiritual battle. And the pastor isn't there to beat you up, and God certainly isn't there to beat you up. But there is one who is absolutely committed to discouraging you and beating you up. And you can hear a wonderful message about fatherhood and totally miss the blessing because you're not listening to the Holy Spirit, but you're listening to the wrong spirit. And you go away feeling all beat up because, again, why? You're focused, you're listening to the wrong message, and you're focused on in the wrong direction. You're thinking about yourself. Oh, you know, all, uh, you know, when, for example, we talk about faithfulness and, and your mind scrolls through this list of ways that you, you fall short and you're not as faithful as you would like to be or should be or whatever. And, oh, I feel so beat up. No, 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 no. <laughs> Let's think about the father's faithfulness. Let's, let's think about these attributes of God that encourage us in our role and let's not be ripped off by the enemy. God wants to speak to us. My, my purpose this morning, and we sang it a moment ago, we have a good, good father. And he has a good, good plan for fathers. And so my purpose this morning, I, I, my prayer is that God's word would clarify for you some things. For some of you, uh, God's word is gonna comfort you because that's what you need this morning. Others uh, may go away feeling challenged. And listen, men, that's okay. I need to be challenged. I need to be convicted sometimes. It doesn't mean God's beating me up. It means God's probably rescuing me from something. And so make sure you're listening with, with a, a heart and a mindset that says, I'm gonna trust you, Father, to be a good father to me. I'm gonna trust you to speak to my heart what I need this morning. And last, I, I, I pray that this, the message would give us courage and that's what I need uh, often most of all is just courage. The word encourage just means to add courage. This is a, a, a scary, wonderful adventure. And it's, it's way beyond my ability to do it well in and of myself. And I need encouragement. I need the Lord to speak courage to me. We live in a culture that doesn't value fatherhood doesn't value motherhood, doesn't value marriage, doesn't value family, doesn't value God. And so we're bombarded with these messages that discourage. They take away our courage. So in those defining moments, when we are, are there just designed by God, set up perfectly to display him, we, we shrink back and we're crippled by fear and, and indecision and, and, and we're distracted by other things. And so rather than being encouraged, we're, we're, we're discouraged because all of these messages are are taking our attention away from where it ought to be. And, and I just, I, my prayer is today we would just dial back in on the Lord himself and say, okay, God, tell us again as men. We're, we're not gonna wallow in you know, self-pity or regret or shame. Yeah, we've all done things we wish we could do over and do better. I got a long list. But, but that's not the point. The point this morning is we're gonna look at our Father in heaven and say, Lord, help me to grow in this area and help me to, to just see this as a precious thing. Help me to see you and let it encourage me this morning. That's what I pray for you dads. 
Let me talk for a minute about just the Father's mandate. Hey, by the way, do we have a PowerPoint, Elsie? I think we should. There we go. Hey, it's there. So the Father's mandate. I, I, I've, um, I've entitled the message this morning of Father's love. And this is the mandate. I want to take you back. Now, I'm not going to really expound on these scriptures, but there are a couple of anchor points that are really helpful. I said a moment ago that I want the message, God's word, to clarify for us what our role is. Well, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy um, <clears throat> chapter 6, it says, Listen, O Israel. Now, this is Moses talking to the children of Israel. He's going to tell them some things uh, that God is charging this nation that is made up of families that are made up of individuals that are led by a head of the household, the dad, the father. And, and the way the father goes is the way a nation eventually goes. And so we need the leadership, and, and it starts out like this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength, and you must commit yourselves wholeheartedly to these commands that I'm giving you today. Repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and when you're on the road and when you're going to bed and when you're getting up and tie them to your hands and wear them on your forehead as reminders. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. I want you to notice first and foremost, you're not going to be able to pass on anything to your children that, that isn't first important to you. You can't give them something you don't have. And so what, what Moses, God is saying to his, his children, the children of Israel, as their father, and he's speaking through Moses, their leader, and he's saying, dads, moms, parents, listen up. You want to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. In other words, if you're going to teach, and that's going to be the, the charge here is to teach them certain things. But if you're, going to, if you're going to fulfill that mandate to teach your children well, it's got to be true for you. It's got to be real to you. And so you love the Lord your God. Everything flows out of that. Commit yourselves wholeheartedly uh, to these commands I'm giving you today. One translation says, teach them diligently. Okay. Verse 7, repeat them again and again to your children. Talk about them when you're at home and on the road and going to bed and getting up. Basically, it's saying, hey, this is a lifestyle. All through the day, you're looking for those teachable moments, and it's just very natural. You just, conversations and observations, and all of this is just as we go by the way. And you know what? Every age and stage of life, from the, from, from the time they're little all the way up through the teenage years and the young adult years, find ways without being, you know, preachy or, or domineering, find ways to just, just talk about the Lord. Talk about truth. Talk about God's purpose and plan for their life. And they had all these ways, these symbols, these things in Jewish culture that did that. They tied things around their wrists and on their forehead, and they wrote things on the doorposts of their house. And, and you know, in our culture today, we, we do similar things, the way you decorate your house. And there should always be reminders and symbols that become these contact points for, for really critical conversations that point your kids to the Lord. And this is your charge, man. This is what we do as dads. A second thing, uh, Ephesians 6, 4, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. So Deuteronomy is talking about teaching. This is talking about that, but also training and discipline. And the idea is we're teaching by precept and by example, but there's also a training element. Training is preparation for the future. Training is preparation is is um, is uh, practice. And if you train more, you have to discipline less. Uh, it's 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 thinking down the road and saying, how do I prepare my child for the future? And and so we're we're teaching and we're training. And he says, and dads, listen, don't make your kids angry. Now, there's a number of ways we can do this. This is a sermon in and of itself. I won't go into it. But you just think about some of the things that, that you've observed that can push your kids' buttons, things that push your buttons. You know, it can be things like um, inconsistency, neglect, um, hypocrisy, uh, overbearing. They're just things that go along in parenting where we, you know, it just it provokes them to anger. And all of us are guilty. I, I've... I've been guilty of this many times, and I'm grateful for this reminder that the Scripture says, look, don't do that. It's going to be hard to, 
to discipline. It's going to be hard to instruct if you're, you're doing things that provoke your child to anger. They're not going to be able to listen. They're not going to be able to hear you. And, and so this is really good wisdom here, really practical. But, uh, and this is our part, by the way. God, you know, you may think, well, I've tried this, and they're not listening, and they're rebellious, and, you know, it's not all my fault. And you know what? You're right. Rarely is everything all our fault. Just like we can't take all the credit when things are going good. Sometimes our kids make us look better than we actually are. <laughs> You know, and, and it's just because God is so gracious. And I'll tell you, so don't swing to those two extremes. Just realize that, that this is what God says to us. God will work in your kid's heart. And sometimes it's a delayed thing. Sometimes you, you've done a lot, most things well and right, and, and you haven't provoked them to anger. Maybe there's moments, but it doesn't define your parenting by any means. And yet you got a kid that they're just going to have to learn things the hard way, apparently, you know. And, but you know what? They'll come back. And we're going to see in our story today in a great example of that. But how do we pull this off? You know, when I was a young man, I, I looked around at my life and I realized, you know, I, didn't, I grew up in a fatherless home and so I didn't get a chance to, to see a lot of things and I was tempted to kind of feel a little bit of a panic about being a dad. I don't know how to do this. I've never seen this. And the Lord told me two things that were super encouraging for me and I just pass it on to you. They're very simple, very practical, but it made all the difference, all the difference for me. Number one, I, I started praying, Lord, give me mentors. And he did that. But... Before he even did that or, or even started to do that, the Lord said, watch me. John, even if you had what many would say is just the world's perfect dad, uh, he really wouldn't be perfect, and you'd still have to look to me. And so what this did is it helped me set aside this sort of this discouraging mentality that said, I can't, I don't know how. He says, well, that's why I'm your father in heaven. Watch me. Open up my word and look at my nature. Look at my plan. Look at the way I, I speak and act and, and think and learn to know the heart of the Father. See, John, watch me. And that has just become huge in my life. But secondly, he did answer that prayer for mentors and he brought uh, father figures into my life. I'm so thankful, so thankful for that. Now, I want to say this just a just to honor my own father. While he was not in the home through my childhood, the fact is he did have, I think, a significant influence in my life. I don't have any bad memories with my dad. I just don't have very many memories. And, and the ones I have were good. Um, and I'm really grateful for that. And my dad came to the Lord later in life and before he went home to be with the Lord, and I'm super thankful for that. But as I look back and I see some of the things that are just kind of seemed like they're in my DNA, I realize, you know, I think I got that from my dad. Uh, my dad was a, a fun guy. He was very creative. And, uh, and I, I like to have fun. I like to be creative. There was a gentleness to him. Now, I'm growing in that. Uh, but... Uh, but but to the degree that there's gentleness there, I think in, in some measure, I, I often think about how gentle my dad was and had a great sense of humor. Another thing that he did is he always honored my mother. Now, their marriage didn't work out, but the fact is, after they were divorced and, and for my childhood, the times I would visit him, he never spoke a negative word about my mother. He said, you know, your mom is doing such a great job. Now, I know that's not, not everybody's experience. I understand that, but I'm just saying that even though there was, there was very little, I didn't get a whole lifetime with him of his influence, there were, there were moments and there were seasons where, where he did what he could. And, and I appreciate that. That was a gift that he gave me. I say that to some of you dads that may be in that kind of situation and you're, you're sad that you don't have more influence. Don't underestimate the influence you have. God can do a lot with a little and listen, God can do something in just a moment of time that you may not even see for years to come. So just, just be faithful to use those moments, redeem the time, and, and point them to the Lord. And that's another thing that my dad did. When I became a Christian, my mom became a Christian. Um, he wasn't necessarily ready to follow the Lord yet, but he, he encouraged me. He encouraged my faith. He was happy to know that I had become a Christian. And, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. And so um, 
but, the, but what about these mentors? There, there are other godly men that the Lord brought into my life, and, and they taught me by precept and by example. And, and, um, but some of the examples, some of my mentors, some of the, the most profound influences literally come out of Scripture itself. And let's take a look at, just we won't spend a lot of time here today, but I just want to take you to one of the most well-known stories, not just in the Bible, but in all of literature, okay? You ready for this? Turn to Luke chapter 15, and we're going to look at uh, verses 11 through 32, and I'm just going to touch on briefly a, just a few things that I think are, are so helpful as we consider this idea of a father's love. What does a father's love look like? And to, to set the stage, I want you to remember the, the context of this story. Jesus is responding to a group of people th- whose hearts are not in the right place, and he, and he starts to tell them some stories, some parables. What you need to understand about a parable is that it's teaching one simple truth. And I, I'm going to take a little bit of liberty. I'm not going to twist it all out of context, but I'm going to bring out some principles along the way that tie back to uh, that one truth, okay? But, but it's teaching one basic truth. And let me show you what it is right out of the gate so you just know kind of where we're going. In verse 1, look at verse 1 first of all. And we're looking at the context of, of the setup to these stories that Jesus told. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them. And he's about to, just rapid fire, he's going to tell three stories, three powerful pictures, and they all have the same point. And here's what it is. He tells a story about uh, a man who has a hundred sheep, and, and he loses one of them. And he leaves the 99, and he goes, and he finds the one. And then notice verse 7, it says, I say to you that likewise there are more joy, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. So, hey, they had this stinky attitude that Jesus was hanging out with the riffraff of society. And he said, and what he's going to do in the process of this parable, these parables, is he's going to let him see the father's heart, the heart, uh, the the loving heart of the father. Okay, and and so uh, he goes to the next parable, and he says it's about. A lost coin. What woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And so she finds the coin, and she rejoices over it. She calls all of her friends so they too can rejoice with her. In verse 10, she says, Likewise, I say to you, uh, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So we've got a lost sheep. We've got a lost coin. And now we're going to talk about a lost son. And the response is the same in all three cases. There is joy in heaven. God loves lost people. Now, I want you to think about this in two ways. Think about this in your role as a parent, as a father. It may be that you have a prodigal on your hands. And, and, and you're tempted to be discouraged and there's just all kinds of drama in your life. Maybe it's a, a grandson or a granddaughter and I think it's really instructive to see the heart of your heavenly father. But secondly, I want you to think about how God treats you because you know what? We're all prodigal. We're all like the younger brother in the story that we're about to look at and listen, we're also like the older brother in the story. Sometimes we're a little bit of both. Okay, and I want you to just know that ahead of time. And, but Jesus, in responding to this superior attitude, tells these stories, and it boils down to this. Hey, I love lost people. I'm here to reach them with my love, and I'm pretty excited about it, and you should be too. You should be too. And this, is, this should shape, absolutely have a shaping influence on your perspective as a dad, Are you rejoicing the way God's rejoicing over your child, even if they're being stinkers, one way or another? What's your your attitude? What's your heart? I can't, I I have a bad attitude sometimes about my kid's bad attitude. Any other takers there? (laughs) I mean, it can happen just like, I I love them, but I can just, I can be just really quickly be caught up in their stuff, and I'm off mission at that point. I totally forget the heart of the father. 
I love this story because it takes us back. But something's lost, something's found, there's a lot of rejoicing. Hey, by the way, I love to throw Robert Wagner under the bus sometimes with this story. This is the story of when Robert lost my son, Caden, okay? Is he here? I don't think he is. I can tell the story. <laughs> I'm, I'm teasing. Uh, so I won't ask for a show of hands, but I think probably most parents have had those moments of just uh, stop the heart, you know, <coughs> cardiac arrest moments where you've lost your child in public. Oh, yes, okay. <laughs> All the men are like, I'm not saying a thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, uh, Robert and I went down, this is back in my children's ministry days, and he was helping me with the children's ministry. We were down in California at, uh, at a children's ministry conference, and, and, and my birthday fell on that weekend. And so, uh, so uh, after the conference, we decided to hang around and go to SeaWorld. And so we went to SeaWorld. I had Tiff come down with the kids. And so we're down there, and, and the whole day, and it's just a great day, and we're all exhausted. We're starting to kind of, you know, not really pay attention too much. You know, we're all tired. And uh, it's, it's, not, it's probably 9 o'clock at night. And we've got the kids playing on this play structure in the middle of SeaWorld. And, uh, and Tiffany goes to, off to walk in this shop and do some, you know, just wandering around looking at stuff. And so Robert and I are there. And after a while, I think, you know, i got to go get Tiffany. Let's get out of here, you know. And so I said, well, you watch Caden. And, and so I took off. And so uh, I went to get Tiffany. About 10 minutes later, Robert comes bopping up, and there's, like, no Caden. <laughs> I'm like... Where's Caden? He's like, I thought you had him. I'm like, ah! And so, <laughs> so I don't know where the communication breakdown was. It was probably me, but it was just one of those just dagger to the heart moments because you're like, you, you know, you hear all the worst stories, you know, children disappearing at places like this and never to be seen again. And so I'm just like, <gasps> you know, and so we're just, we're running all over the park. We grab security. Everybody's looking and, you know, about... 15, it felt like an hour, but it was probably more like 10, 15 minutes. They found Caden. He's four years old. He has no idea what just happened. You know, we're just all dying, you know. But listen, there was rejoicing over my son who was lost, but now it was found. And so when I, when I read this parable, it just reminds me of that. And um, I want you to see something here. He says, uh, the, the, it says, a certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so he divided them his livelihood, and not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. And that's where the, tar the term prodigal comes from. I think it's been rightly pointed out, though, that uh, really, probably, this story should be better entitled The Prodigal Sons, because we're going to see by the end of the story that, that both of them, you know, had their heart issues as it concerns uh, the father. One missed the father's heart by being very bad. The other missed the father's heart by thinking he was very good. Um, and, uh, but this guy, he starts out saying, Father, give me. And I want you to see the contrast between the selfishness of the son and the selflessness of the father. He says, Father, give me. Give me the inheritance. And astonishingly, the dad does. And I think it's important to realize his son's going to go on and display foolishness and wastefulness. And we can expect this from our kids. I think part of the reason sometimes we struggle in family life in our role as dads is we just have unrealistic expectations. The reason you're there is because your kids are selfish and foolish and they need, they need to be taught and trained and loved well. And I think this is an encouragement just to remember that um, uh, we need to expect our kids sometimes to be that way. And, and by the way, so are we. And that's why we need a heavenly father, because we can be all of those things too. But he divides to them his livelihood. And what a, what a contrast we're seeing here. This incredibly patient and selfless dad grants his son's demand in this almost unbelievable sacrifice of love. So father's love is sacrificial, and that's the first point I want you to see, and, and I won't develop it in any great length, but just, just understand. You want to say, what, what? God, what are you saying to me as a dad? Well, well, I believe the father would say to us that I want you to love the way I love, and that means you're going to have to be sacrificial in so many different ways, and it's oftentimes in the face of ingratitude. And why, what about the family inheritance? The elder brother in that culture got twice as much as the younger brother, but it wasn't given until the father died. 
You say, well, why is that so significant? Because culturally, (laughs) this younger son's demand was in effect saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. That's what's going on here. He didn't care about his father. He only cared about his father's wealth. And you know what? The truth be told, the Bible tells me and tells you in Ephesians chapter one, you can go read about it. It talks about our spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And you read five times in that passage about the inheritance. The, and we we uh, are God's inheritance and he gives us an inheritance in so many ways. We're adopted, we're forgiven, we're this, we're that. He gives, I mean, so many things go along with being a child of God. And how many times am I demanding things of God and I think if he were just to speak audibly, he might say something like this. You already got it. I've given you everything you need. You're just not looking close enough at me. You're not trusting me. I've given you everything you need to do what I've called you to do to fulfill this high and holy calling. And so many times we're wanting more. We're demanding And Jesus, now this is so clever. He's drawing in his listeners. Remember the audience. There's tax collectors and sinners and self-righteous Pharisees and scribes and disciples. They're all there. And I can imagine some of those who were maybe the black sheep in their family, so to speak, as my mom was in her family. And she, she, she tells her story. And I bet they were listening with great curiosity, wondering just where Jesus is going with this story. And so you have this demanding and disrespectful fun son with a huge sense of entitlement saying, give me. And we see in the face of it a father's sacrificial love. Well, it goes on. It says he he wasted his possessions on prodigal living. Prodigal just means wasteful and extravagant. So he takes the family inheritance and he goes and he he just blows it all in this crazy uh, life. All this living for his own thing, his own pleasure. Timothy Keller, by the way, if you've never read any of his writing on this, he just opened my eyes to unlock this parable for me. I've I've never seen it the same. I've never preached it the same. He wrote a great little book. Actually, it was a sermon that they just kind of put in book form, little coffee table-sized book, and it just says, and the title of it is The Prodigal God. And in in a really insightful little twist, he basically says, just like the son was extravagant in his lifestyle in a wasteful way, God is extravagant in his love. And, and, and if you could say it this way, it's, it's almost scandalous. It, it, it seems wasteful. Like, he would do that for us sinful people that don't deserve it? Yes. That's the father's love. He's extravagant in his love. He's a prodigal God in that sense. There's another great parable that Jesus tells about a hidden treasure in a field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid and for the joy over it goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. And guess what the punchline is? You're the treasure. He gave his son, his only begotten son, so that we could have eternal life, put our faith in Christ. We're the treasure. He gave everything for. And we take God's blessings. We spend it on ourselves. We come up empty and unsatisfied. We, like this young man, spiritually malnourished. What a picture of desperation. Again, the crowd that he was speaking to, there's a lot of desperate people there. Where's he gonna go next? What's this rabbi gonna say next? Usually when I listen to a Pharisee or a rabbi teach, I mean, they they find me repulsive. And what Jesus is going to display in this story is far from it. God doesn't see them as repulsive. Hmm. I can imagine many were saying, <laughs> you're telling my story, man. The truth is, no matter how desperate we, be, we become, the enemy doesn't give us anything. Notice it says they wouldn't give him no one. Verse 16, he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods the swine ate and no one would give him anything. The Bible says of Satan that he's come to steal, kill, and destroy. And you can go waste your life living for the devil. And you know what? He's not giving you anything. He's not giving you anything. No matter how hungry you get, no matter how malnourished, no matter how desperate you are, he'll never give you anything but a hard time. But this God, this prodigal God, he says, I'll give you everything. 
I will give you a love you don't deserve. How's it going to end? How do you see others who are spiritually lost? How do you view them? Do we see them as repulsive? Do we think to ourselves they deserve what they've got? Or what's the matter with them? Why don't they, you know, change or just do something about that issue? Again, sometimes we can even look in our own families at members and see them that way. That's not the way God sees them. Notice verse 17, my favorite line, one of my favorite lines in this whole story. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I'll arise and go to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. When he came to himself, I like the NIV translation that says when he came to his senses. Can you think of defining moments in your life where it's like life just kind of whacked you on the head and he's like, oh, I've come to my senses. We've all probably had experiences like that. Well, listen to this. The Bible tells us God's goodness leads us to repentance. In other words, it wasn't primarily this guy's circumstances that got his attention and started pointing this young man in the right direction. Pay attention. It was thoughts of his father. This means the second, brings me to the second point I want you to see. A father's love is approachable. Approachable. This dad, however things were left with him when that guy left his old man on the front porch and went running off to Vegas, however it, it went down, whatever was spoken, he was left with this, this impression. When he came to his senses, he didn't remember a red-faced, screaming father saying, don't you ever come back here again. You've shamed the family. You know what he thinks of? The approachability of his dad the dependability, the reliability. That's amazing to me. I will arise and go to my father. Knowing his father's character allowed him to have hope. Do you see that? Reflecting upon what his dad was truly like gave him assurance that it's worth the risk to be honest with myself for the first time. It's worth the risk to humble myself and be repentant. It's worth a risk to move in a new life direction. I think of this about my kids so often. I ask myself, you know, if they ever, if they ever just go off the rails in life, they stop and think about their dad. What are they going to remember? What kind of expression will they see in their mind's eye? I, I hope they see the heart of the father. <laughs> He said, I perish with hunger. Oh, there's no good reason for anyone to perish with hunger, whether unrighteous or whether self-righteous. Sometimes we're spiritually malnourished in one way or another, but this God is approachable. Hmm. And notice he says, Father, make me. Because he finally became humble, because he finally started speaking the truth to himself, look what happens. He goes from saying, Father, give me, to saying, Father, make me. He was willing to just be a servant. He was ready to, to really engage now for the first time in this meaningful relationship with the Father. And he, came to his, he arose and came to his Father. You know what? You will never have the courage to get up and the strength to change and move your life in a new direction and go back to God. If you've run away from God, you will never get up and go back to the Father if you're focused on yourself and your circumstances or your past. What enabled this guy to get up and go back to the Father and discover the Father's love was simply considering the Father. That's what was so inviting and so attractive, and that's the kind of dads we want to be. But it wasn't until he came to his senses and stopped focusing on himself started focusing on his father. He was able to find that strength and get up and go. Almost done. Number three, a father's love is hopeful and vulnerable. Notice this. And he arose, verse 20, and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. So a father's love is hopeful and vulnerable. And, and the reason I say that is because this dad from the text, it appears that he was just scanning the horizon. He was looking out the front window. He was just waiting for that day when his son would return. He didn't write him off. Now, again, this isn't, you know, I don't want to make every detail in the parable mean something profound, but I'm tying it back to this truth that he's going to get to where he says, hey, 
I've come to seek and save the lost. That means the perspective that God has is he, he believes in something better for you. And he's willing to be vulnerable. He's willing to sacrifice himself. He's willing to keep scanning the horizon. He never writes you off. And that's the way that we're to be as dads. It's still a great way off. Oh, he never gave up the possibility of being reconciled to his son. And fatherhood brings such vulnerability, and it makes us uncomfortable as men. We don't like to feel vulnerable. Our pride tells us we don't need the acceptance of others or even those closest to us. And when we deal with a rebellious child and their rejection of us and our advice, it's tempting to put up walls of protection so we don't get hurt anymore. And those walls can be a mile high and a mile thick and like a fortress around our hearts for years. C.S. Lewis touches on this in his book, The Four Loves. Listen to what he says. It's very sobering, but I think it's instructive. We need to hear it, guys. To love it all is to be vulnerable, writes Lewis. Love anything, and your heart will be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give it to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. Oh, it will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. To love is to be vulnerable. It's, it's, it's so important for us to be like the Father in this story, and we can't if we're not first transformed by the way God loves us. It would be so undignified for an older man in the Eastern culture to, to run. He had to gird up your, you know, tie up your robe and, and you know, reveal your legs. And that's the way to, it was undignified for a, a, a gentleman to do that. And, but he throws his arms, and it's been rightly said. I think it's a good insight. Probably the reason he did that is he wanted to get to them first. Because in that culture, if you shamed your father publicly, it was a shame to the whole village, and they took it personally. And the Bible says in Deuteronomy, that the, in, the, in the law, that, that that kind of incorrigible, rebellious son that was just terrible to his family could be stoned. I think the idea here is, is in their culture, he said, do you see the Father's love? He is, willing, he is willing to wrap himself around you and protect you and take the hits. Far from writing you off, being repulsed by you, he loves you so much that he will run to meet you and he will surround you with his love. He had to be first to get to that young man. I love it. And the father said, and, and notice how this son, he's rehearsing. Do you ever do that? I, I want to go back to God, but I don't know what to say. I mean, this is the umpteenth time that I've blown it, and, and I just feel like such a loser, and what's he going to say? And, and, and we rehearse, okay, here's how it'll go down, you know, and we rehearse it in our mind. This guy starts in rehearsing his speech, yo, dad, I'm, yo, you know, he, he doesn't even let him get through it. Before he gets to the, the line of make me just like one of your servants, he butts in and he says, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand, sandals on his feet, bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. A father's love is unconditional and joyful. I mean, he just showers this kid with grace and mercy he says, I don't need all your excuses. I don't need all your promises to do better and try harder. I don't need any of that. You need everything. I don't need anything you got. You need everything I got. So just receive it. And the, each one of these things were symbolic. The ring, the sandals, the robe. It was just a way of saying, welcome home, son, you're, you're still a part of this family. I love it. Unconditional and joyful. As dads, we forget to just simply enjoy our kids. Oh, we need to enjoy our kids. Do they see the joy in your eyes, the delight in your eyes, that acceptance? I love this picture. The Bible says we're made alive in Christ and it's by his grace and his mercy. 
Well, I want to uh, jump to the last one. Um, so those of you in back, um, I'll, I'll do this next part real quick. Basically, the older son's out in the field. He comes to the house. He hears the party going on. And this is, now, if the Pharisees at this point were listening to the sermon for someone else, you ever do that? <laughs> Yeah, those sinners, they need to hear that they're, they're that younger son. They're the rebels. They're the ones with the real problem with God. And right here, he just, he hits him between the eyes and he says, the older brother. And this is the whole reason he told the story. Most people get it all wrong. They think it's all about the prodigal son and the younger son. No, it's not. It's really, he's telling the story to get the attention of the older brother, which is the Pharisees. And, and this guy goes down, he says, he's, he, he, he's just upset and angry that his dad would be so prodigal, so extravagant, so wasteful. He, does, he won't even call his brother his brother. He calls him this son of yours. And, and he's all upset about it. But what we see as the story comes to a close is... This father that, was, that, that, that ran to meet the one son, he also goes out of the house to plead with the other son. Same father's heart. He's a faithful dad. He's faithful in his love and he's faithful to the truth. He said, hey, it's, this is right. This is the right thing to do. We should be rejoicing this son was lost and he's found. He was dead. He's alive. And, and <laughs> some of you parents have been through this. You know exactly what he's talking about, don't you? And you rejoice. And, and God rejoices when lost people come to him. He was so angry he wouldn't go in. I think there's a lot of dads, sadly, our anger and our disappointment and our unmet expectations can keep us from entering in, from going in to the party, so to speak. Helping our kids recover, helping them learn, helping them grow from their mistakes. See, he ran to the one son. He came out to plead with the other son. That's the heart of the father. <laughs> they both were his favorite. I told you, that's what I like to say to my daughters. I'll hug one of them while one's standing behind him and I'll point at the one. I'll say, you're my favorite. The one I'm hugging, <laughs> the one I'm hugging thinks I'm talking to them. I'm pointing at the other. It's so mean. But they're on to it. Usually as I'm hugging them, they'll say, Dad, I know you're pointing at Haley. <laughs> but they know. They know they're all my favorite. And that's kind of the way that the heart of this father. He loved both of these boys. And they didn't understand his love. Well, maybe after this they did. I hope we do. Would you stand together with me? Father, we thank you that we can come to you in Jesus' name this morning and celebrate not just the role of fatherhood that we get to enjoy. It's so important. But we get to celebrate that you're our father and you are a good father. And in a moment as we sing this song, I pray that we would sing it with just a renewed appreciation for this simple truth, but powerful and profound, able to completely transform our lives. If we really understand and receive it and believe it. Lord, I, I pray for the dads today. They'd go from here just really encouraged by who you are and what you've done. Maybe just seeing a, a different angle on things today just because your word does that so faithfully. Help us grow in the grace to be the dads you've called us to be. Help us not be crippled by the past or even the present, but to just be free to move forward in your grace and power because we've, we've seen some some truth about you that reminds us how it's all possible through a relationship with Jesus. This we pray in his name, amen.